everybody, welcome back to another episode of Honestly Bilal. I am your host, Bilal Med, and I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Toledo. And this is Honestly Bilal, the show for the aspiring ophthalmologist, where I sit down and talk with medical students who are interested in ophthalmology, residents training in ophthalmology, and with current ophthalmologists in the field today. My guest today is Dr. Robert Swan. Dr. Swan is the residency program director at SUNY, SUNY, SUNY Medical Center in Syracuse, New York. Uh, and Dr. Swan, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. So, you know, just want to get your story. Everybody has an origin story, but what got them into ophthalmology? What got you into the field? What, got, what piqued your interest? Origin story is a great idea. You know, it looks back, you know, when you go back 10 years, you say, well, I was always going to do this, but um, you know, I came from a family, nobody was going to, everybody was teachers and they didn't fully understand the whole doctor thing. They're like, well, I guess as long as you have a retirement, mm -hmm. well, you know, but they, luckily your brother's going to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I was just sort of in medical school and I was looking at things and I kind of like was one of those students that liked it when you were doing it. So I was like, oh, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon. And then you, and then you'd be like, well, I think it's, I think I can cure cancer. And, um, you know, you work your way through and you're like those, the acid base stuff from nephrology, like I can nail that. Um, and, but a lot of it, it comes down to somebody said, well, you better like what they do every day, you know? So if you're a nephrologist, you're interested in dialysis, right? And I said, I'm not the least bit interested in dialysis. And they're like, well, that's going to get kind of tricky. And the same thing for endocrine. Like, so you want to treat diabetes. And they're like, well, not really. I was kind of thinking like the other rare ones. And like, well, um, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I, I finally had this sort of like breakthrough where I said, I don't want to be in a hospital every day. And I think as medical students, we pretty much were in a hospital every day, or at least for me. Like, and I just said, I don't think I want to be here every day. And so I said, well, how do I get out? Because I was like, you know, I'm too deep in debt and there's no financial resources to be like, oh, you don't want to go to be a doctor? Don't be a doctor. You know, like, that's okay. And um, so I looked at Durham and I thought I would be, you know, I was like, well, I could, but, but I just had this moment where like Durham is great in the abstract. Like we know that they're happy. We know that um, it's competitive. And, and, but I was looking at somebody, I just, I, I know right where I was standing and I was looking at this person going to surgery and their skin, I was like, they need to, that's disgusting. Mm. And I realized like, you're not going to be a dermatologist. Like you, you know, like, unless you're, and I knew I didn't want to be one of the cosmetic dermatologists, you know, like saying, oh, if you use this cream, you'll be three years younger. I was like, hey, you're not going to, you're not going to be a dermatologist. Like you can't be looking at, you can't have a visceral reaction and, and do it. And so um, all roads kind of led to eyes. And so I mean, I didn't know anything. I went to our classmates who had been wanting to do it, you know, the full time of medical school. And I was like, what about this? They're like, well, we don't like that somebody else is interested, but beyond that, you might like it. Mm -hmm. And so I did the clerkship. And um, as I kind of said in my interview, like when my friends were at the bar at 6 p.m. and we were still in clinic, it was kind of okay. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, you know, one thing leads to another and that's how you got into it. And um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, at the time, I thought that it was a knowable entity which was kind of fun. Like, I don't know if any other medical students have this. Well, I mean, it's an obvious misconception, but you believe that, you, you know, like the eye is small enough and the books are large enough that it's known, mm. right? I mean, other things are so big, but I mean, we can look at almost every cell layer of the eye. We, I, as a uveitis person, I'm looking, I'm counting individual white blood cells to monitor inflammation. I mean, it's nuts, but the, the deeper you go, the more you realize that, you know, of course that that's not knowable. And if anybody aspires to do uveitis, it's a series of, well, that's a good one. That's also a good one. Well, you sound like the other one. That was a pretty good one. And, um, and that's, so that's how I got into eyes. And so, yeah, no, actually, you know, you're my first guest who's really um, specializing in uveitis specifically. So do you mind tell, you know, telling us about uveitis and what the, sub what the subspecialty really focuses on for anybody who um, out there may not uh, have yeah, much sure. Ophthalmology. What does uveitis really encompass in terms of the scope of uh, diseases and, 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 and stuff like that? You know, the truth is, I didn't know what it was either, even in uh, residency, because what, what standard uveitis is what you know from your step one. And it goes something like this. A normal person who has a B27 gene all of a sudden has this really red inflamed eye and a bunch of the time, but not all the time, they have ankylosing spondylitis and sometimes they have psoriatic arthritis. And like that's sort of like that's uveitis for the masses. Mm -hmm. but, but the more interesting, it's sort of a sub, what I would describe it as is that remember that the eye is made of collagen. 
and thus it's susceptible to all the same collagen vascular disorders that are the rheumatologists see. So the lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and Wegner's uh, granuloma, GPA. Um, and then the, there's a whole subcategory. So these are things that they all do autoimmune things to the eye, but there's a whole, at least half, where it, that a person doesn't have anything systemic. And so you're sitting there saying, your eye is really inflamed. And in some cases, you're inflamed in this layer or that layer. And if you're inflamed in one layer, it may have a different look than a different layer, or it may uh, lead to different problems. You know, that um, uveitis encompasses scleritis. And some people melt and some people just get red. Some people are annoyed and some people will lose the eye. You know, it's, um, it encompasses pemphigoids. Um, again, it's sort of like this, this catch-all, it's got to go somewhere. And you're like, oh, I think it might be inflamed. Go see Swan, you know, like, but um, the choroid is one of the richest blood supplies. And you know that from step one, you know, like that's one of those, well, guess what happens to really well vascularized things? Um, infections from the blood get in there. And so we, you know, we deal with a lot of these, um, you know, weird infections and stuff. And, and it's not an isolation. There's, if there's a surgical problem, usually you need a retina surgeon, but the retina surgeon says, look, I, it's sort of like the, it's the nephrologist who does dialysis all day. And then you say, well, what about this weird acid base thing? And they're like, well, what do you think about that? You know, but that, that's uveitis. And so we have a number of people. Um, what people don't know is that it's one of the um, leading causes of blindness in a um, industrialized society. It's like the third or fourth, but it adds up. I mean, most of my people are working age. Some of them are medical students. Some of them, well, I've got a number of a little subset of kids too, which break your heart but most of them are 20 to 40, 20 to 50. There's a lot of FMLA. There's a lot of disability. There's a lot of, um, it, it, they don't necessarily go blind that easy. Most people bl see blind as, you know, you put the black blindfold over you like the Ninja Turtle movies and, and you know, um, the, it's more impaired. You can't drive, you're 25 or 30 years old, you can't drive at night anymore. Mm -hmm. But your job needs you to drive at night. You don't have that job. Um, you can't read small print books. Um, you, you know, therefore you need um, occupational things for that. Um, some of your visual field is missing. So you don't see things right here that well. It's, um, that's the UVA, is, it, it smolders and it gets you that way. Yeah. It is erosion, it is water damage, it is, and when you finally go to one of these houses um, that's had all these problems, it's really hard to pick up the pieces. It's, because ultimately the tissue is just not going to let you. So that, I hope that gives you kind of an interesting, and we look, and the, uh, I guess one final thing I'll say is that most of it looks the same. Most fires look like fire, even if the causes were different. So um, a B27 fire can look a lot like a sarcoid fire, can look like a syphilis fire. They're all, you know, the, you, what you really see is the inflammatory component. And then you'd start looking for the cause. And that's where, as an ophthalmologist, it's a lot of internal medicine. Like, tell me about your travel history. No, really. Um, okay, let's, let's, let's do a complete review of systems. Wow. <laughs> because if their tattoos swell up, that might matter. Hmm. In fact, it does. Uh, and among other things, you know, these sort of oddball, it's, it's a lot of, um, well, the rheumatology, if you spend some time with the rheumatologist, and you'll, you know, you, you see kind of, but it's, now you have an eye doctor being like, let's get personal. <laughs> Right, right. But they keep their clothes on. That, that's where I draw the line. I was like, you know, if, if you think you've got a rash, I will send you to a dermatologist who will take a good look at that rash. I'm sure it's disgusting. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so that's, that's a good point. So that really covers everything then. I guess, uh, you know, I think that's a good way to put it. And uh, I think uh, that it is a field from my, my understanding that really encompasses a wide spectrum of pathology and, uh, you know, um, and etiologies as well. So uh, I see it as a big circle where other people's circles intersect. Mm. So the, the scleritis and ulcerative keratitis and the pemphigoids intersect with the cornea doctors. And then I intersect with the retina doctors for the deeper stuff. I intersect with the children's doctors for the things that hit the four. The JIA kids are, um, you know, they're four sure. with this. So, um, yeah. yeah, I make a lot of friends. The oculoplastics for the pemphigoids too. It's uh, everybody <laughs> owes me a favor. Right. I'm not exactly sure how to collect. Mm -hmm. but everybody knows. <laughs> You're like the Dr. House of, uh, of eyes, I guess. That's kind of. Well, I think that's UVI to specialists. And the, the problem is that there's always a better one. And you sometimes wish that the person could trip. Like, like, have you ever been to California? You might really like it. There's somebody in California that you would really enjoy meeting. And you're like, 
I'm not going. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm going to go back to the literature searching and we're going to see what we can do. <laughs> so, so, you know, Dr. Swan, let's, let's talk about, uh, you know, SUNY, SUNY Upstate Medical Center. Absolutely. Um, you know, as residency program director, um, you know, what, what are some things that, about the program that, you know, you really uh, want viewers and listeners to, to know and uh, where are some things that excite you about the program? And, you know, just generally talk about the culture there and what makes it the program that it is. Sure. Um, I've been at the helm now for four years and I've been there for five years. Um, as best I can say, it, my view of a residency is sort of like an older house. It, it, everything needs to be in time. You sort of like go room by room. And in the last four or so years, we've essentially modernized the entire house. I mean, it really, uh, with the right graphical technological thing, it'd be fun to do one of these flipper flops where you do like the before and after and say like, yeah. you know, we have put $2 million into the clinic to make it a shiny and new clinic. We have put, I don't know how much money into the OR to have the up-to-date scopes and FACOs and this and that. And you want a piece of equipment? There it is. Um, we've introduced image management to get our, all of our OCTs and everything. The, the old process was well, you get the thing, it gets printed by a color printer, it goes into the resident office, you hope it comes out. Um, all of that image management is available. Um, we've instituted in the last year, Dragon Dictation, which is, we're still figuring out how to use it, honestly. I mean, it, it dictates, right. but the commands, the um, how do you, and um, we've really worked on our epic modernization. And basically I put a lot of these into the bucket of resident wellness. Mm -hmm. Um, because if you look at a wellness, there's a culture of wellness, but all of the, the, if you, of the people that make these um, flow charts that are so beautiful, it's sort of like individual resilience, culture of wellness, but there's this big part about like efficiency of practice. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to make somebody frustrated, have them click 35 times to say it's a corneal abrasion, you're fine. <laughs> and, 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 but if you can make that better. And so what we really focused on is almost like a click bounty where if you can find a way to do it better, we'll institute it. Mm. And um, we've reduced our Epic clicks by about 50%. And little by little, I've climbed the ladder and I'm on one of the specialty board, steering boards for Epic at the national level. And that's really the big premise um, to try to get things a little bit better. But that gets into what our culture is, is what I try to instill is that you are the doctor. You are here, uh, you are no longer an observer. You're no longer a fly on the wall. You know, like, yes, there are times where you're gonna look at an inflamed eye and be like, I'm interested in, as you kind of say to the patient, like, I know what I think, but I wanna see what Swan thinks about this. You know, like, that's okay, but I want you to be thinking about it. Like, I don't want you to say like, Dr. Swan, your patient's here. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I've got techs who can do that. Right. So like being the doctor, like sort of saying I'm uncomfortable right now, mm -hmm. but if I were to say to you, okay, and this is what we eventually would get to the third years and think like this person's now in your office and clearly need, they need to be in my office. What do you do between now and then? What do you tell them? How soon do you refer them to me? Are you going to, are you going to be one of these people that picks up the phone and everybody you see needs to be seen that day? Or is this a two week thing or, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so really that autonomy is very important to us. Um, and it's a big transition. It's as a medical student, you, there's a beautiful dance that we, at least I used to, and you do sort of like the shadowing, like I am omnipresent, but I'm never in the way I am this, but I am not that. Um, I would never spit. Whereas as the resident, you're like, look, you're going to see this person on call. What are you going to tell them? How are you going to initiate rapport? Mm -hmm. um, so that's really important to us. Um, a second culture I've tried to institute and it's going well, is sort of like, I want all the residents to be in it together. Your strength is in your collective um, cohesion, which means you can't have big brothers. Like you can't be the senior resident saying, well, Swan's not that bothered about this, but I'm going to punish you. Mm -hmm. And so we've rooted a lot of that out over the years and said, look, you know, like you guys are the good cops. Um, you need to be building each other up. And if there's a problem, it should come to me, but let me give the negative feedback. Let me help them. And um, so that's an important thing. Um, other aspects in terms of, um, the people like Syracuse, if they like Syracuse, it's upstate New York, it snows, it's cold sometimes. If you aren't, I mean, but a lot of people we've had, you know, people from Michigan, people from Ohio, a lot of the Northeastern, they, it's not that much of a culture shock to them and they're happy. Right. Um, you know, and I believe that other people would be happy too, but it's tricky sometimes because 
you know, somebody from the right climate who prefers that area and they just sort of, and I interview them and they come up and they're like, I'm a Democrat. And I'm like, oh, that, that, that kind of hits. Or, you know, like they, they used to have the interview like right in December, you know, close to the solstice, but it was like the darkest day on the, so it was dark and snowing. And you're like, what do you think? You know, um, but low cost, you know, like the thing is though, we're geographically isolated. We have this huge catchment area that people come here, they're not going any further. They're not going to be like, well, if you're, if you don't know, I'm just going to go to the residency program down the street or something like that. It's like, you don't know, I guess I'll see you in two weeks and you'll figure it out then. You're like, yeah, I'll see you in two weeks. I'll figure it out then. Um, so it's, it's positive that way. And with that catchment area, um, we generate a lot of surgery because that's what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and the people are happy when they come, you know, it's, it's, they can afford a house on a resident salary. And so we have several residents who come with their families, whose wives stay home. Um, with children and be their homeschool or they go to the school, but like, nevertheless, like you can afford to have a house and a car and a family without being subsidized um, by one way or the other. And so overall, it's a pretty nice place. It's just the, the downside to it is that it's in upstate New York, which is a downside if you consider that a downside. Oh yeah. I mean, that's it. which some people do. And, but those of us who are here, we're happy there. Sure. Yeah. And there's always something about anywhere that there can be, you can look at it bad or good or whatever. I mean, it's all about perspective. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's talk about what, as your program director, what, what, you know, I'm, I'm sure right now is uh, you're, you're going through these applications. There's hundreds of them. Um, uh, it must be very challenging, especially in a year like this where, you know, can't sit down with you one-on-one -on -one in person. Right. Um, you know, what are, what are some things that you're, uh, if you're, if you're open to telling us, what are some things that you are looking for when you're looking at these applicants that really st stands out to you and, and what are you kind of thinking about when you, uh, you're, you're considering who to invite down to Syracuse, up to Syracuse uh, for- I'll the, take up. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's, a lot of it is, you're trying to get the best, the person has put their best face forward mm -hmm. in the application and we have put our best face forward on the, um, the website and as best we can. When we're looking for people, people, uh, the autonomy thing, the job thing is hard for some people. Mm -hmm. And so um, like the job aspect of the role, because like as a medical student, like how many times have you said, oh, emergency meeting, forgot to mention it, 2 p.m. Friday, not going to be able to be back. It's going to take hours. It, it just happened, just happened. You know, like, like, all right, we'll go. You know, like it's, that's the, the beauty of the upside of the medical student role. Whereas the resident, they're like, well, it's getting late, but there's still a person who hasn't come. And I'm like, I know, I'm here too. Like you're looking for somebody that will kind of take on that autonomy to be like, I'm the doctor. I'm supposed to, I'm here. I'm representing the department. When somebody calls for an ER uh, consult, I have to go. And uh, you, as a human being, you might not want to go, but it's that job mentality that can be, it, 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 it's, there's a duality with the educational component, but on some level it's, you don't have that sort of like, can I call in sick well, I, you know, I, I don't feel like coming today. Like, you know, the, the medical, especially modern medical students, like, you know, we used to sometimes, I mean, now I notice that a lot of education is sort of like while you're doing your own thing at home, where at least that was in upstate. Like, the, the, when I went to give a lecture five years ago, they're like, there was 20 people there. And I was like, I don't get it. And they're like, oh, don't worry, they're watching. Yeah. And um, now they, they said, there's no point in even coming to the room. We just, you videotape it, they'll watch it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas residency, you you have to show up, you have to be on time, you have to be presentable. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking for that. So people that have had employment, people that have set, like, who have slaved it out at a subway, that's worth something. Right. Basically, like, have you had a boss that was not very nice? Have you been in a situation where you couldn't just walk away? Um, and most people have, you know, like there's a certain amount of grunt work um, that comes with residency and you can't really get around that. Um, I'm looking for somebody who's going to make the program better. Mm -hmm. So I'm working, I mean, I'm constantly putting the time in here. We are on a Sunday morning, you know, but it, it's, it, it, there's three types of people, right? So like I sit there and I say, look, the website's going to be double important this year. Here's my proposed edits to the website. Mm -hmm. And one portion of people are going to not even read the email mm -hmm. or if they read the email. They're not going to open up the attachment to read it. Another portion will be like, yeah, it's good. You did great. And then the third portion is like, here's some edits. That's who I'm looking for because that's how you make the place better. That's the agency that I want people to have. You know, we had one resident recently who was like, "We need a whiteboard." Like, we do need a whiteboard. Yeah, a whiteboard. You know, like, but th that's what you know, like, or th there's certain things like where they'll, you'd be surprised how much somebody will suffer. And it was like, 
th their Epic wasn't working right. And so like every time they did a pair of glasses, they'd go up to the front and sign the the prescription themselves. And you'd be like, I, why didn't you just tell somebody? So I'm looking for that agency to say, I've identified a place for this place to improve. It's a, I, um, there's a broken window strategy of policing, but it's, I believe in something similar for residency where a series of small improvements over time is more important than the Martin Luther 2.0, 56 grievances, like find something small that bothers you, fix it. Sure. Um, and so one of the residents, you know, they do a lot more culture swaps than I do. And every time they were doing a culture swap, they were writing out this complicated form that was not even, it was meant for surgical. It was meant for like, if you put a kidney into a bucket, and you wanted to send it to somebody you'd want to write out specific things about that kidney and we we're like so i went to pathology because this was bothering them and they're like you just print this it's an epic he's like you just hit this little button it prints out you just put that right in there that's all we need mm -hmm. I was like, that's it okay but done so now but you know that's where then we get into well i need a printer and that's where my chair is very useful when i say i need a new printer for the procedure room mm -hmm. here's your printer um the final thing i'm looking for is I'm trying to get a sense for applicants that will put the time in. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to explain that because as a medical student, if I tell you, you're going to read the book when you come, right? You're like, of course I'm going to read the book. Read all the books, every book, all day, lots of books. But when you get here and you've worked all day, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to go home. And, and the thing is that they get this complacency where it, the first like six months, you, you're pretty good at what you do. Mm -hmm. Most of the stuff that comes to the clinic is the usual, oh, it's a glaucoma suspect, eh, they're dry, they're irritated, this, that, that. But it falls into a spectrum of, I'm used to that, which is good. That's the whole point of practice is that you get used to certain scenarios, but it's when the oddball comes in and you're like, well, I have no idea what that is. Mm -hmm. And initially you're like, well, you should read about that. But as you get to like the second, third year, you say, boy, you know, like, you don't seem to know what any of these oddballs are. You get the OCAP back and it says you didn't do that well. And the reason is, is that every day you thought you were doing well and we told you you were great and we are, you know, you're an excellent clinician, but when it came to, to the test, there weren't any glaucoma suspects on the test. Mm. There was only one macular degeneration on the test. You know, there's only so much about cataract. And that's where um, we've been really pushing the last couple of years to say, look, um, we need to, as a, as a culture, be reading. Because there's always gonna be the outlier, who, there's always gonna be somebody who's gonna read everything. And there's always gonna be a bunch of people, one or two who just isn't. But what I want is to be in a room, I, I believe, um, there's a theory about riots and it goes something like this. If you want, the grandmother is not going to throw the brick through the window first. You're going to need just about everybody else in the room throwing bricks to have um, the, the grandmother do it. Sure. I believe in some level, and that might not be the best example, I agree. But, but it, from a thoughts perspective, I believe that if I can get six residents that are consistently reading, they're going to reach the other two out of the three who would if everybody else is right i mean because you, if you're sitting in a group of friends and you're like you haven't seen this show and all of a sudden everybody's telling you about this show and finally they're like all right i've heard about it. i'm gonna read this i'm gonna watch the show you know like i think that that works for residents too because i mean i can be on high saying you will read and i do but it's not that effective it's the crowd sourcing is far more effective in this and then you get to that one out of nine who's just not going to do it and that's where you come into my office and you say look you know like i have people who would kill for your spot what are you going to do next year when I give it to one of them? Oh, I'm going to, well, I was going to read, you know, well, or, and that's some other ones, it gets into, well, and this is where there's the nuance. I go home every day to a wife and three kids who miss me. I go home and I don't see them. That's my time. That's my re, and I said, I, I understand that, but you need to carve this out because you're going to be, if you, if you are going to be the breadwinner of the family, then you, you failing your boards is going to be far more infl uh, it's going to matter and it's going to be even harder then. So I was like, you know, this is where you as a family need to figure this out. Now, maybe daddy's busy before noon on Saturday and Sunday. So you catch up or maybe daddy gets up earlier, you know, but, but that's, that's how you catch these people and that's how you help them. And, and so that's when we get into what are we looking for? I, if I can get somebody that has that kind of agency that will help me improve the place, that will help themselves improve, and will approach this as a, um, this is my job, I am responsible for these people, I want to help these people, I'm going to have an all-star resume. Yeah. And th then you try to figure that out from the applicants, which is slightly harder, but it happens. <laughs> sure. And I, I trust you. I'm sure you're going to find a great way to make it work. And I think yeah. that's 
those things where it's a, there's so many different aspects of going from the medical student role um, that I'm sure I'll be able to reflect on uh, starting July 1st, but uh, hopefully, but um, you know, I think those things that you mentioned, that duality of being the you know clinician in training now, but also still the student, um, you know, there's the learning aspect and there's definitely the huge, bigger learning curve in ophthalmology, maybe compared to other uh, other specialties, but you know, you find out that probably PGY2 year, and I'm looking forward to that. And I guess you're right about the things that matter in terms of the effort outside and also what values you bring to the program, what, what can you contribute to the program. I think we're all looking to hopefully uh, bring what our brand, if you will, to uh, the place that we end up at and what our thoughts and try to reflect positively on the place. So, uh, you know, I can tell you from the applicant point of view, there's a lot of really talented people out there who I've gotten, had the chance to get to know. Um, so I'm sure you'll find, you'll find great people too. So, Absolutely. Uh, you know, Dr. Swan, I want to thank you so much for, you know, talking about your program, talking about UVI, is talking about, uh, you know, what you see as, a, as a, your, your perspective on ophthalmology and um, hopefully we can meet in person someday. And I'd love to bring you back. Hey, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Hey, Good luck. Bye-bye.